Okay, we're starting. Okay. Hi, Peggy. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Um, so everyone, I want to welcome Peggy Simmingson of UT Arlington today as our featured guest to talk about the future of academic publishing. Uh, currently, her research focuses on digital pedagogies and how they engage pre-service and in-service teachers to most effectively help them teach literacy in their current and future classroom contexts, as well as looking at socially distributed knowledge sharing that takes place online and in video mediated discussion and dialogue. So it clearly we have the right person for the job awesome. today. Yay. So I'm, I'm delighted you agreed to join us. Yeah. And again, we have a, a few questions that are gonna guide our discussion today on the future of academic publishing, but feel free uh, to jump in at any time and okay. uh, really see it as a dialogic conversation. Yeah, I like that. Not so much as, a, as an interview. Of yeah, sounds okay. good. All right, so the first uh, question that I wanna chat about is what do you think has changed um, in terms of academic publishing today from traditional or historical notions of academic publishing. Okay, awesome. I have some notes, so I'll share. These are just off the top of my head, things I've seen, heard, conversations, so, and feel free to, to jump in at any time. Sure. I kind of put them in rank order just because I'm like that. Um, so open access publishing is huge, as you know. People sort of resent having to pay. You write articles, you pay. Uh, I mean, you have to pay to access your own article, right? And so it's really hard to disseminate knowledge, which isn't the, isn't that the point of, of writing and doing research. Absolutely. And then the, sometimes publishers think they do you a favor by giving you 25, 30, or 50 uh, downloads, right, mm -hmm, for your article mm -hmm. as if you won a prize. So yeah. <laughs> I totally know what you mean there. Yeah, totally. It's a scam. So mm -hmm. people are opening up journals. We have to be real savvy. Some of them are um, questionable, majorly so. So judging quality with open access is the caveat or double-edged sword. That's a really good point. I, I actually have colleagues who are not as adept in terms of making those judgments of evaluation in terms of the merit of a journal, right? So they get an email from somebody <laughs> in uh, a different country, a different state. Yeah a different organization you never heard of that's in Hawaii, and um, you know, a conference or a paper in this case, uh, it seems like an opportunity to get published because we know we have those pressures on ourselves mm -hmm. to get one, mm -hmm. two, three publications a year in many places. And so those pressures oftentimes lead people into perhaps making, um, you know, not, not the best decision in terms of where to publish because as I teach my students, where you publish should be the starting point uh, in terms of your research design, right? So mm. how, how can you come up with a research study um, if you don't know where you're going to disseminate it mm. to? Um, or even how can you write the study after you've done all the research without the readership and the audience mm -hmm. in mind? Yeah, the audience, that's key. I totally agree. They go hand in hand. Yeah, those are great points. I like that. And after I got tenure, I started to really think about meaning what do I want to study? Where do I want to publish? And meaningful venues are key. Absolutely. So, yeah, thanks. Also, um, you mentioned uh, blogging, and so I just want to mention blogging. Also, what I consider like extended, really long form blog posts, not just stream of consciousness, but really well crafted blog posts can be often, sometimes cited. So, a scholar at our university in ed tech is George Siemens. And he's hugely cited, and some of his most cited papers are almost white papers, mm -hmm. or almost like extended blog posts. And his, you know, he'll get he'll get quoted and cited just from blog posts. So depending on how big of a scholar you are, you know, it, you can extend into these other areas. So what do Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. I yeah. mean, I know you're probably familiar with the Literacy Beat that's oh, headed yeah. up by Bridget Dalton mm -hmm. and and various colleagues. And I think there's another one that I learned. Uh, I think it's like vocabu blog or something like that. And uh, that's another one that, you know, not only do classroom teachers and graduate students go to, but also uh, peers in the field. So mm -hmm. having those outlets where you can quickly disseminate information that's mm -hmm. very timely, mm -hmm. I think is um, an incredible opportunity that we have today, right? Yeah, um, good so point. It's, it's, it's beyond just posting on Facebook or Twitter saying, go check out my new article that's in JAL that took a year and a half to get published. 
it's go check out this research study I just did last week and I just mm -hmm. wrote it up over mm -hmm. the weekend. Right, exactly. That's so, that's so great. Um, and then I, you mentioned too podcasting and I see you, you're all set up. That's awesome. But like enhancing with multimedia. So podcasts that a journal editor asked you to do, but it can even be one you do yourself or your own YouTube channel. As you know, I'm a big fan. You are. I, I hear you just hit the million minute mark. <laughs> not or you're not yet. The, you're approaching the million minute. That's incredible. Yeah. I have to go out and celebrate. I'm only about party. a million behind. So pretty close, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah so that, that's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. I know you're a leader in that, uh, in that field and, uh, it's not jealousy, but I definitely am trying to take points. You should do that. Uh, get a green screen. Yeah, right. get, a, get a green screen. <laughs> Set it up in your place. Absolutely. That's great. Uh, I, I think along with that, as you know, JAL and these other places are doing the audio uh, interviews and so forth with the authors. They've been doing that the last few years, posting on there. But I think one thing that could be, um, that could be elevated even from that level is doing video snippets mm. uh, to whet people's appetite for mm. reading the article. I mm. think those podcasts from Jaw and the like, mm. uh, to me often, it's good to follow up with that after you read the article. Whereas mm. I'm looking for like a video snippet of something to, to catch a, uh, you know, a viewer's attention to say, you know what, I want to download that 20 pager and I want to, you know, sink my teeth into it. I'm thinking of doing a course trailer for my courses. Like I know students exactly. have to take my class, but you know, I want them to like it. So absolutely. That sounds That's fantastic. great. I like, I like that idea of anticipation. Um, and then also just having this digital presence through Twitter, I think mainly Twitter. Um, yeah. Are you on Twitter? I am. I, I need to use that one more. So now, Me too. Um, but yeah, I, I find that, some of the best articles I've come across have just been on, you know, random happenstance mm -hmm. through social media. You know, mm -hmm. if something catches your attention, you look at it, you're like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. I can use that in my class on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Just grab it. Yeah, right. totally. And um, so thought leaders, you can follow influencers. Um, and then I don't use these much, but I know a lot of people are using like ResearchGate and academia.edu. What do you think? About yeah, I, I've been using those as well. I think part of the part of the reason there is institutions are all about metrics these mm -hmm. days. Yeah. And so any way that you can prove that, uh, you know, you have a high citation rate that mm -hmm. people are viewing mm -hmm. uh, your articles or your YouTube channels and anything like that can provide additional evidence to university bureaucrats that sometimes call into question what it is you're doing when you're not teaching. Mm, that and, impact and, uh, and influence. Yeah, absolutely. And it shows, also sort of the academic lineage or the tree from which that the, the, the tree that's formed from your initial seed of your mm. paper, mm. right? So you can go back and, and look, uh, you know, what came from schema theory, the original mm. paper, and you see mm. all of these from there, whether if you use Google Scholar or like you said, academia.edu and the like. Mm -hmm. Got it. Awesome. Um, I think that's all I had for that. You know, okay. I think, I think it's, we're still trying to figure this out, this Absolutely. answer, yeah. Okay, so let's shift to question number two, which is, um, what advice do you have in terms of trying to find additional forums or additional journals for publication beyond those that are affiliated with typically national organizations like the International Literacy Association, the Literacy Research Association, NCTE, a ALER, et cetera? Okay, I have like a twofold answer. One okay. is just, I don't know about you, but I'm online a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, more often than not. Yeah, right? usually on my phone. Um, well, but, I, was, yeah. I was on the, um, on the metro train coming here, and I, I was on um, the shared Google Doc that you sent me. Oh, yeah. And you can see you updating it on yes. my phone on a bus in New York. So. <laughs> and I was updating it, yeah, <laughs> on my phone. Weird. Um, so yeah, those types of things, but I just get on the internet and Google good uh, journals. And so I just kind of random, I would just call it random Googling um, yeah. for topics, for journals. Sometimes people have curated lists. So I guess other people's curated lists. I found one actually from Eric, you know, sort of the library reference tool. Oh, yeah. And it was, it was, again, I Googled it, I came across it and it was journals just in the field of education. So it could include mm. CNI and TESOL and special ed and the yeah. like. And um, I'm actually embedding that into a class I'm gonna be teaching 
So it's, it's amazing what you can come across through, uh, you know, through these search engines today. Yeah, and then the other part of that is just, uh, you mentioned cabals or cobbles, whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, cabals, yeah, uh, cabals. Uh, directory. Yeah. I, I don't know when that started exactly. I was familiar with it during, I think, my doctoral program. So it's been around for a while, and, and the, the cost of the subscription has increased over time. But many uh, uh, institutions of higher education subscribe to that, and you have access. And if you don't currently have access, maybe you can figure out a way to, to do so. Yes. But those, those provide that invaluable information regarding acceptance rates and how long the journal has been around in terms of you know, years in, in publication as well as sort of target audiences and how many times a year they publish, all those sorts of things that are really relevant. Yeah, that, that acceptance rate thing really matters when you're a new scholar. Absolutely. Um, I have a joke on that. And there's this journal called the Journal of Universal Rejection. And I'm not <laughs> sure if you're familiar with it. It, it, it touts itself on having a 0% uh, acceptance rate. Oh, that's funny. And therefore is the... Um, I guess the most reputable journal in some people's <laughs> eyes, uh, according to these makers. So as a joke years Elite. ago, I sent a paper to this group and then within a month or two, they send you a reason as to why they didn't accept it. Oh, that's so, so funny. <laughs> it's like masochism or something. Right. That's so funny. I love it. And then you probably do this too, but um, follow the right people um, and explore other fields. So as we all know, literacy studies is extremely interdisciplinary and it's probably intersecting with like literally every single field out there, social science, et cetera, humanities. Um, and then just exploring um, different people. So there's somebody, I'll give you just an example, Michael Barber, he's a Canadian and ed tech and he's like everywhere all over the internet. So I follow him and he tends to write interesting things and I just kind of, so it's just looking at where those people that you follow are publishing and then also paying attention to the inner, you know, staying open to interdisciplinary scholars or scholars in related fields kind of Absolutely. expands, expands your, um, I totally agree because stuff. you can come across a new journal or, a, or a, a related field of yours with some overlap that you had never come across before yeah. just from being open to looking at, uh, you know, other scholars work, and uh, and even pr perhaps organizations that you weren't always familiar with. Right, exactly. So ed tech has been that way for me. Mm -hmm. So exploring. And then have you have you been have you ever been part of a mastermind group? I have not, not to my um, knowledge, unless no. I just tapped in somehow. So <laughs> tell yeah. me about tell me more about okay. that. Well, it's not as scary as it sounds. Okay. Um, but it is just people who meet and encourage one another. Um, you know, kind of like a community of practice, but a little more underground and not visible. So in contrast to everything we've been talking about, about putting yourself out there, it's sort of a self-contained little group where you share, bounce ideas off of each other, say, have you thought of this? And that kind of thing, like a support group, but very career focused. I like that idea. Yeah. Um, did, I, I, is that one that you're a part of uh, with some of the LRA folks? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a back channel. Gotcha. Basically. <laughs> yeah. But they started in business that were not corporate. <laughs> gotcha. But anyway, Super. that's all I have for that. I think um, there's hashtags that I think you can follow. Everybody probably knows that, but I'm interested in the future of work and then kind of thinking back towards what does that mean for education? And literacy. Yeah. So I follow that hashtag and I've learned about new people. Super, super. And then I see also uh, listservs is another way that we can perhaps try to find some additional outlets. I know um, on the LRA lister, for instance, about maybe three weeks ago, uh, Language Arts, the journal Language Arts, um, sent out a call for manuscripts over 2017, 2018, et cetera, mm. that I shared with my doc students. Because yeah. if they already know what they're looking to, to publish in thematic issues, then mm. why not see if somehow you can tap into that with your existing work? And I've read it's a little easier to get into a thematic issue, depending on your niche. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a little <laughs> bit of both. So, you know, okay. I, I, maybe, a, maybe it varies. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I don't know either. Um, and then, yeah, that's all I have for that. Just kind of follow okay. the right people and keep your open mind. Keep an open Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. And, and be proactive. You know, 
Yeah. And also, you know, when you attend uh, sessions at conferences and the like, oh, yeah. uh, many times they'll say, oh, well, this is going to be published or this was published somewhere. And you mm. might not have been familiar with that forum. Yeah, it's kind of planting seed, people planting seeds. Especially with the, some of the international organizations we're familiar with. Good point. Yeah. The, uh, the last question that we wanted to look at is how do you envision the future of academic publishing to look like? And what does that say about what we value uh, in terms of research and expert knowledge? Okay, yeah. I, there's something else I wanted to add. Print publications that are published online can also have a lot of hyperlinks in them. So much more hyperlinked text, even within print, I think is coming. That is true. And, so. uh, and using that, right? So not yeah. everybody has always used those um, available links but I think it's invaluable to really try to maximize our use of those. Yeah, that's great. I just finished up my column um, year for the Allen Review, and that was one of the things is they have hyperlinks and encourage you to, to hyperlink the text. So I think we're gonna see more of open access publishing. I think, again, it goes back to budgets and finance. It's kind of economically driven. What do you think about that? Yeah, I actually just, just uh, I did some homework, I think it was yesterday, and I saw that, for instance, the major TESOL journal, which is called TESOL Quarterly, oh. is shifting this month from being print-based to fully open access. And mm. I think that's a testament to, and, and seconding what you're talking about, that major organizations and, and longstanding academic journals are making that shift, uh, not only for monetary reasons, but also for access. Mm -hmm. You know, that idea of open access really resounds with I think faculty in general and in the, in the, you know, the area of academia, because what we do, we don't want 10 people to read about. We want 10,000 people to read about across 10,000 countries. Mm -hmm. We want it to have wide readership. And that doesn't necessarily mean graduate students from different colleges in mm -hmm. the North Carolina area. For right. Instance. That's too you know? limited. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then this idea of the quantified self, um, so tracking your views, um, and you know, we don't just write sole author, but you know, tracking the views of your articles and things like that. Tracking alt metrics, which is like, you know, who's reposting your, the link to your article, who's listening to your podcast. Absolutely. Um, so and then I actually had, had a radical idea. I don't know if you agree mm. with it. What? Um, in some ways I'm calling into question the written word itself mm. as the primary avenue for publishing. Mm. So most people, if you think about it, what do they do in their free time or when they get five minutes uh, you know, to themselves? Maybe they listen to music, they watch movies, et cetera. Very few say, you know what I wanna do? I wanna read the next academic <laughs> article that just came out. And I think these notions provide you know, some fodder to consider for future conversations on this topic. Mm. Um, you know, there is a longstanding tradition of the written word mm -hmm. being sort of, um, you know, the, the rule of thumb, but that hasn't always been the case with, you know, storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, oral, oral discourse and so mm -hmm. on over mm -hmm. the years and in different right. cultures. And I, I'm sort of debating as to what impact that might have when, when most things in life are very multimodal. Multimodal and, and keep our attention better. Um, it's funny because with technology like us, we're taught, we're, it's all oral. I mean, we're speaking. So it's funny right. that technology takes us back to the oral component. And just this, this video podcast won't have too much writing associated with it, but hopefully no. it'll still be informative nonetheless. Awesome. And that's, those are the main ideas I have. Um, Super. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that wraps up this, this quick conversation. I really want to thank you so much for joining me today as we talk about the future of academic publishing and hopefully there'll be some more opportunities for us to do the same thing. Sure. In the future. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Evan. Thank you so much, Peggy, and take care. Have a good one.